Hi everybody, I'm Fab Fonte, and you're watching Fonte's Inferno, the circle for fans of film and comic books. In this episode, we're going to revisit the good old, bad old days of New York City with Marvel Comics Cloak and Dagger number one. A few years ago, I reviewed Marvel Comics Cloak and Dagger No. 1 from their 1983 four-issue miniseries. Written by Bill Mantlo and illustrated by Rick Leonardi and Terry Austin, Cloak and Dagger No. 1 was the title character's first solo comic after five appearances in Peter Parker the Spectacular Spider-Man. Cloak and Dagger's first appearance in Spectacular Spider-Man No. 64, written by Bill Mantlo and illustrated by Ed Hannigan, was a powerful introduction to the characters, highlighting their powers and their motivations for distributing their brand of justice. But that initial story made it really hard to gauge Cloak and Dagger's role within the Marvel Universe, because they were written as two powerful beings hell-bent on vengeance rather than classic Marvel heroism. So a little backstory before we take a look at the first issue of their 1983 miniseries. Tyrone Johnson and Tandy Bowen, two teenage runaways, are held captive at the mob's secret drug lab on Ellis Island and used as guinea pigs to test a new synthetic drug. Unlike the other runaways, Tyrone and Tandy survive the effects of the deadly drug and now have powers of light and darkness. Tyrone envelops criminals in the cold, dark void within his cloak, and Tandy has the power to emit lethal daggers of light. Now we fast forward to the first issue of their 1983 miniseries. The story begins with Father Francis Delgado walking the crime and drug infested streets of Hell's Kitchen, observed by Cloak and Dagger from the top of the Port Authority bus terminal. After a noble but unsuccessful night of trying to save the street walkers and criminals, Father Delgado returns to his 42nd Street church, praying for the strength to continue his mission. But his moment of despair is broken up when Cloak and Dagger, bathed in her light, appear on the altar. Moved by his desire to save the hopeless, they ask Father Delgado for sanctuary in his church, and recount the dark circumstances that led to their powers and their mission of vengeance against predators of the innocent. Meanwhile, at Hell's Kitchen's 21st Precinct, a doctor tends to a group of sick men in a jail cell. The doctor can't make out their puzzling symptoms that the cops dismiss as a bad drug reaction. Detective Bridget O'Reilly has seen their type before, lowlifes that prey on young runaways in the Port Authority bus terminal known as Chicken Hawks. O'Reilly takes an interest when one of them tells her about the vigilantes that took them out. His description of Cloak and Dagger matches the NYPD's previous reports of powered vigilantes that took out organized crime and drug dealers, and O'Reilly will be damned if she lets them control her territory and get innocents killed. Back at the church, Tyrone and Tandy are given shelter and food, but Father Delgado wants answers. He's calling the police to confirm two vigilantes fitting their description have made waves in Hell's Kitchen, but Father Delgado respects their request for sanctuary and won't turn them in. Cloak and Dagger are confused as to why Father Delgado would show pity toward the criminals they target, but Father Delgado stresses they still must be prosecuted according to the law. Cloak isn't convinced of Father Delgado's argument, and they once again take to the streets of Hell's Kitchen. At Port Authority, Jerry and Alice, teenage siblings running away from a bad home life, step off the bus without money or a plan. They are quickly marked by Port Authority chicken hawks promising them food and a place to stay. But as quickly as they walk through the door to their den, motives become clear and they can't fight their way out. But Cloak and Dagger, following them since they got off the bus, bust in to dispense justice on the predators. Dagger gives them an opportunity to let Jerry and Alice go, but her good deed goes as expected, and one of the thugs charges them. Trapped and released from the cold, dark void of Cloak's cloak, his cronies don't make the same mistake and fire on Cloak and Dagger. The gunfire draws O'Reilly to their lair, but as the runaways try to escape, Jerry is killed by a stray bullet. Any thoughts of mercy are cast aside as Dagger's shards of light take out the three remaining chicken hawks. O'Reilly threatens Cloak and Dagger's arrest for the death of Jerry. Dagger is shattered by the death of an innocent as O'Reilly hammers them with the reality that their methods are no better than those of the criminals. Cloak and Dagger teleport back to the church, where Dagger begins to question their actions. In the background, Father Delgado is called to administer last rites for the dead runaway. Compared to the origin stories of the other Marvel heroes, 
Cloak and Dagger's origin is pretty dark stuff, right up there with Luke Cage's origin story from a decade earlier. But Cloak and Dagger number one takes this to another level, as Tyrone Johnson and Tandy Bowen navigate the seedy, dangerous New York City of the good old bad old days of the early 1980s, with the drugs, prostitution, and crime represented in an unflinching manner in Bill Mantlo's scripts. It was usually the art that drew me to buy a particular comic book, and this was no exception when Cloak and Dagger hit the stands in 1983. Just seeing Terry Austin's name on the cover was more than enough for me to put my 60 cents on the counter and buy this issue. His inks were a great match for Rick Leonardi's pencils, and to this day, an original page of art from this miniseries is still very high on my want list. But it was Bill Mantlo's writing, particularly his use of 1983 New York City as a backdrop, that got me to buy the subsequent three issues of this miniseries. Mantlo pulls no punches when writing about the perils of runaways and unprepared newcomers to New York City, so this is a hard-hitting miniseries, establishing Bill Mantlo as a passionate, uncompromising writer that incorporated social issues into this comic book. His writing, combined with Rick Leonardi's pencils and Terry Austin's inks, brought the seediness of early 80s Hell's Kitchen to the comic book page. Issue number two was inspired by real-life headlines from that era about a sick sociopath that poisons bottles of aspirin to kill random, unsuspecting people. And in the first issue of their later bi-monthly series, Cloak and Dagger take on the predators that ensnared young women into a nightmare life of Times Square peep shows and worse. Looking back, I'm actually surprised at how much of this atmosphere they were able to use in their stories. This was a comic book that likely had a significant readership under the age of 18 that depicted prostitution and drugs. This was pretty dark stuff for the time, long before dark and gritty would actually become overused in comic books. While Cloak and Dagger never had the same level of popularity as the Bellwether characters like Spider-Man, The Avengers, or The X-Men, to name a few, their 1980s stories were exciting, their backstories hard-hitting, and their obligation to fighting for the weak and seeking vengeance on the wicked was very powerful. In spite of their short comic book runs, or the sales figures of their issues, Cloak and Dagger truly fit the Marvel premise that Stan Lee had used to describe Spider-Man. Cloak and Dagger were two young characters trying to navigate their powers and the tribulations of life, but their entrenchment in the crime and drug-infested underworld of New York City put that premise on steroids. Cloak and Dagger number one of the 1983 miniseries still resonates after almost 40 years, and that's a testament to Bill Mantlo. Even though it represents an era of New York City that hopefully won't make a comeback, there's a timelessness to these stories, and I highly recommend revisiting them. The first four issues of the Cloak and Dagger miniseries are currently available on Comixology, and single print issues and the hardcover trade are reasonably priced on eBay. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, please hit the like button, leave a comment below, and let me know what you think about Cloak and Dagger. Don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell for notifications, and check out my website fontesinferno.com where you'll find other comic book reviews from previous years. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the Inferno.